Well, I have to say I'm uh, an ex extremely thrilled this morning. Hear that noise in the background? <laughs> That's my grandson, and he's in church on his second Sunday of life. That's, that's, we're off to a good start there. Mom and dad, little baby in church on a Sunday morning. That'll work. Amen? Amen. Train up a child in the way he should go, the Bible says, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. So mom and dad, hang in there. Hang in there. Do, it, do, it, do what's right. Your, your boy will benefit from it. And grandpa will be happy. You want to keep grandpa happy. So, um, this morning, we're going we're gonna, to, it's in a way continuing on our message of the tale of two brothers we talked about the last couple of weeks. Before that, we talked about um, ideas around discipleship, and we've, we've looked at several passages of scripture, even before the Christmas holidays, about churches and how they work and, how, and why they do what they do, those sorts of things. And this morning... Um, we're gonna, I'm doing a message on the nature of the church. Uh, next week, we have Steve Van Ostrom from our regional office with us. He's going to continue this train of thought and, and bring a message to us called the purpose of the church. And the nature of something, and I want to kind of lay the, how these two things are related. When we talk about someone's nature, we're talking about their disposition, right? Dale has such a great nature. We know what we mean by that when we say that about him. Now, it may not be true, but, <laughs> but we know what we mean, right? That when we talk about someone's nature. Well, that nature, that disposition, personality, if you will, uh, that they have flows into what their purposes are. And so that will be the topic for next week. The church, as a living organism, the body of Christ, has a nature, and as we watch how God interacts with humanity, we can identify seven different periods in the Bible that are characterized by rules that govern humanity's relationship with God. And this becomes relevant when we see the church in the scope of how God has worked in the world because it is unlike anything the Lord's ever done. The church is unique in, his, in the economies that we see in the scriptures. You know, each of these divine undertakings, if we can call them that, follow the same basic outline. So when we look at different periods in, in the scriptures, we see that God establishes his expectations. He promises blessings for meeting those expectations. Humanity fails to live up to those expectations and disobeys God. A resulting judgment comes bringing dire consequences for humanity, but then God always circles back and brings a promise of redemption. We see that pattern over and over and over in major segments of the scriptures. Major economies, we'll call them, or dispensations is another word you'll hear used for that. These seven periods, sometimes called dispensations, help us understand why God did certain things years ago that he doesn't do anymore. For example, under the dispensation of law, one's relationship with God was determined by one's adherence to the law of Moses. The Mosaic law included animal sacrifices for sin, right? But under the dispensation of grace, God no longer requires animal sacrifices for sin because Jesus' sacrifice is a once and for all sacrifice that brings atonement and redemption. So we're under a different economy in the church than the Jews were in the Old Testament. There were different sets of rules in, in, in play. There are seven dispensations in the scriptures, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time in each one. I'll go through and kind of outline and give you a sense of how they fit into the biblical framework. But there are seven different periods uh, that a biblical history is organized around. There's a period of innocence, which, which goes from the creation to Genesis 3, right when Adam and Eve fall. Then there's the, the period of conscience from Genesis 4 to 8, and that's after the, the fall into sin and what, what came, after, came after that. That led up to the, the consequence of the great flood, Noah's flood that happened. Human government came out of that from Genesis 9 through 11. That didn't work. That was a horrible failure at the Tower of Babel. The promise then 
then we come into the time of promise. And that's where God singled out a man in, in Ur of the Chaldees by the name of Abram and said, hey, follow me. I'm going to make a great people out of you. And then we know the whole story that unfolded with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that period up to God meeting the Israelites on Mount Sinai, which inaugurated the next, the next dispensation, that of law, the Mosaic law. And he entered into that covenant with the, with the Israelites. That uh, dispensation was in effect up till Acts chapter 1. Then when the, Jesus left and sent the Holy Spirit and the church officially became the agency through which God was going to now work in the world, we moved into the, the present dispensation that we are in today, and that is the dispensation of grace. And there are a different set of rules working today that were not in place under the law, for example. In the period of the, you know, for humanity experiences God's presence differently in each of these dispensations. For example, during the period of innocence, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening. They saw him face to face. That's pretty amazing. In the period of the law, God's presence was experienced through the tabernacle and the temple. God's presence was in the holy of holies, shielded away from human eyes. The only person allowed in there once a year was the high priest, and he had to enter in with the blood of atonement on the day of atonement when, that, when the uh, sacrifice was made. And he brought that blood in and sprinkled it, sprinkled it on the Ark of the Covenant that was in the Holy of Holies, which is where the Shekinah, or the glory of God, rested up until it left Israel. That's a different story. It's later in the scriptures. But that's, that's that period of time. Under the law... The Jews, if they wanted to experience God's presence, they had to go to Jerusalem and participate in the temple rites prescribed by the law of Moses. In six of the seven dispensations, we see the division between those who obey and those who reject God and disobey him. The disobedient in each dispensation, it's interesting to note this, wage war against the obedient. In the dispensation of conscience, for example, Cain murders his brother Abel because God accepts Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. From that point on, we see a clear line drawn between those who, as the scripture says, call upon the name of the Lord and those who rejected him and became a law unto themselves like Lamech's great boast in Genesis chapter 4 when he murdered the young man who uh, tried to hurt him. This, that, dispens, that dispensation, that dispensation of conscience, ends with one man and his family being spared the judgment of a worldwide flood as God wipes disobedient humanity right off the face of the earth. You know, that's how that, that dispensation is brought to an end. The followers of God in each dispensation are God's witnesses to those who do not follow him. The nature of that witness changes from period to period, but God always has a witness on the earth. Have you noticed that in the scriptures? There's always a witness on this planet of, of our God. The Bible says that Noah in his day was a preacher of righteousness. His preaching was not a message of redemption, however. It was a message of unavoidable cataclysmic judgment with an appeal for people to repent and get on the boat. Not one did. Under the law, the nation of Israel was to be a witness to the Gentile nations of the earth. And by adhering to the law of Moses, they would model what a godly nation looked like for the rest of the world. That was part of their covenant. They did not live up to that. The basic message each witness bore was the same. They brought a message of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If you look at each of these major epics in biblical history, you'll find that the, the messenger that God sends brings a, a message of sin, a conviction of sin, a message of God's righteousness, and a message of, a, of coming judgment. Sin, this is the part of the message that points out where humanity was failing God, where they were missing the mark. And the Greek, the Greek word for sin is hamartia, and it literally means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. When you, you take and you shoot an arrow at a target, and you don't hit the target, you miss the bullseye, that's a sin. 
So God has a target out there of what he expects a human being to look like, live like, and behave like. And if we miss that mark, that's sin. And God holds us accountable to that. That's part of the message that the witness brings. Then there's the message of right, righteousness. This is the part of the message that points to God's standards of righteousness, his expectations. The people of a given dispensation are measured against that standard. And then finally, judgment. The third part of the message speaks of God's judgment on sin for humanity's failure to live up to God's standards of righteousness. Included in each, in each dispensation is a way to escape the judgment. God's not, he, he always makes a way. He is so patient. And in spite of our, our, our sins against him, our, our inability to be obedient and follow him, he always makes a way out. He always provides a way of escape. Included in each dispensation is that way to salvation. We don't have time today to investigate all these things and look at them and see how they apply to all seven dispensations. I want to zero in on how they apply to the dispensation in which we live, the dispensation of grace, because that brings us back to our subject on the nature of the church. You see, the witness to the world in our dispensation is Jesus Christ. This is why I've come into the world. Jesus said, to bring light, because men love darkness. You know, you, when you read what Jesus says about himself and his mission and why he came here, he came to be the witness of God. In, in Hebrews, as a matter of fact, the Hebrew writer calls him the, the, the great apostle. He's the great apostle that God sent. Apostle means the one who is sent. That's why Jesus came. He was and is the witness of the truth. In John 8, 40, he said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. You know, he's, when, he's, when he's making his case with the Pharisees who are arguing with him and trying to accuse him as blasphemy, he went so far as to, as to even declare himself to be the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. Right? He told his followers that an advocate would come, the Holy Spirit, and that he, the advocate, listen to this, would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. There's that threefold message again. Now, I want you to understand something. Here's one of the big changes in our time, in this period of grace we are in. It is essential that we understand that Jesus Christ himself is still God's witness to this world during the age of grace. That has not changed. It is essential that we understand that the physical presence of Christ in the world is the church in which, of which he is the head. We are literally the physical manifestation of Christ to this planet right now. He's still the witness, but he's doing his work through us as we are empowered by whom? The Holy Spirit, right? Through the Holy Spirit, we are the manifest presence of Christ in this age, not individually, but collectively. As an individual Christian, I have my, my, my part to play in the bigger scheme. It's not about me. It's about us. It's about him. And together, we make up the body of Christ. Every single one of us, we're absolutely essential to God's plan for Canyon City. That's why we're here, right, in this period of time. Where we are is where we, is, you know, bloom where you're planted. That's one of those old cliches, but that's, that's really the truth. This is where God for now has put us to bloom and to take, take up our part in his kingdom. John Walvoord, who's a longtime president and, and theologian at Dallas Theological Seminary, said this. Any intelligent observer of modern Christianity soon becomes aware of the widespread confusion that exists concerning the nature of the church. Okay, this is the important part of the quote I want you to hear. If it is true that the church is the present divine undertaking, i.e. the presence of God on this planet, a lack of understanding on this important subject will blur not only the theological perspective, but make impossible a practical approach to the present task of the church. It is impossible for us to understand our purpose until we understand our nature. 
And our nature is that we are the body of him who is the head. And he is still the witness on this planet through us. This is, our, this is who we are. Walvert is basically saying we can't truly understand the purpose of the church unless we understand the nature of the church. Purpose and tasks associated with that purpose come from the church's nature. So let's talk about a little bit more about this idea of Christ on earth. The church is the physical presence of Christ on earth as a redeemed con congregation. The Greek word for there is ekklesia, which literally means the called out ones. We are called out what are we called out of? The world. He has singled us out. He has called us out of that. He has translated us, Acts chapter 26. Paul, sa Paul says that his message was to help the people who were enslaved to Satan and in darkness to come into the kingdom of light. Colossians chapter 1 tells us that we have been translated from darkness into the kingdom of light. That's, that's our, that is our collective standing in the Lord. The means, the, the work of the church, that means, excuse me, the work of the church is to fulfill Christ's agenda of making disciples. His great commission did not include starting food pantries, crisis pregnancy centers, or providing shelter for the homeless. That was not, he did not command us to do that. Go therefore and create lots of food pantries. That's not his commandment. He gave one command to his apostles when he left. Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Now, humanitarian efforts are included in the spirit of the gospel. How could they not be, right? How could they not be? Given that Jesus himself is called the great physician, he fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He welcomed the outcast. These are things, activities, that his followers should do. But these activities are not his mandate. They flow out of our nature because of who we are. It is in our nature now as God's people to be generous, to be compassionate, to be caring. But that's not our mission. You tracking with me on this? And what's, what's happened in modern Christianity is we've, that's become the mission and we've lost sight of what Jesus said to do, which was to make disciples. You make disciples, this mission, these other things are going to happen because of the nature of who we are in Christ. But those things are not our mission. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And at one time, we were objects of God's wrath. Think about that for a minute. There was a time in your life where God looked at you with great ire. When you were outside of Christ. That's kind of scary. We were objects of God's wrath. That's Ephesians 2.3. We were doomed to destruction, but by his grace he saved us. Amen? Through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Right? We have been saved by his grace. We are no longer objects of wrath. We are no longer slaves to sin. That's not who we are. Our salvation from start to finish is a divine undertaking. We didn't earn it. We can't earn it. We're not born into it like you were, if you were a Jew, you were born into Judaism. It is purely a gift from God. How many of you have received that gift this morning? It's okay to raise your hand, don't mean? Yeah. Amen. Right? That's the gift we have received. And because of his grace, we who were once outcasts and slaves have been made living stones, 1 Peter 2.5, and are being built up into a living temple with Christ as the chief cornerstone. Through the church, the world can experience the presence of God. Christ is still alive and well on planet Earth. We are his presence here. That's kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? 
and underscores just how important we really are in the scheme of things and what's going on in our world right now. Our message during the age of grace is consistent with God's message in previous dispensations. It's a warning of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now listen to this, though, but we're not the ones to preach that message. The Holy Spirit is. That's what Jesus said when the advocate comes. He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And the problem is when we try to take on the Holy Spirit's jobs, we really mess things up. And we wind up chasing people away from Christ rather than letting him, them be drawn to him. Tracking with me on that? Only the Holy Spirit can bring conviction that leads a sinner to repentance. If you try to browbeat somebody with the scriptures and, and push them into salvation because you, you care about their soul, you might commit a spiritual abortion. That is the, sal, uh, the salvation of anyone's soul is a complete act of God. All we can do is be the witness. That's it. So let me qualify what I just said. Are we to preach the word? Yes, absolutely. All of it? Yes. Are we to live exemplary and godly lives amid a crooked and perverse generation? Yes. Are we to warn a disobedient world of the consequences of rejecting Christ and the gift of salvation that he offers? Yes. So what does this conviction look like then? that the Holy Spirit brings upon the world, and how does he bring it about? And to answer that, we have to apply Jesus' description of a true disciple to the term, make disciples in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. Okay, well, what does a disciple look like? What is the, when Jesus said that in his mind, what was the end product? How do we know if we have become true disciples of Christ? How do we know if our approach to discipleship in our church is producing what Jesus envisioned when he said, make disciples? And Jesus himself gives us the answer. That's a good thing because I wouldn't have an, any idea how to answer that question except that Jesus gives us the answer. Jesus himself said this, by this will everyone know that you are my disciples. What? What? Let me hear you. If you love one another. John 8, 35. How will the world know if we are truly disciples of Jesus? By how our love for each other. That's our witness. That's part of our witness. God measures a true disciple by how they love fellow disciples and by extension, how they love the lost. Paul writes this, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. We want people to come to Jesus. We know how all this ends. We know where this is going. I want my neighbors to come to Christ. I want my children to grow up knowing the Lord, the people I know around me. I care about the lost. So do you if you're a believer and you're walking with the Lord. It's inevitable. You, you, that's his heart, right? Right? But Paul goes on to say, for Christ's love, love, Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who, would, who should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So read that again. And he died for all that those who who live, should no longer live for themselves. That's us. We're not, it's not about us anymore. It's about this bigger universe that Jesus has brought us into. But we want to live for him who died for us and was raised again. That's the mark of discipleship. Do we love each other? Do we take care of each other? Do we love the people around us? Even when they cut us off in traffic, I'm working on that one. Yeah. Back to our previous question then, how does the Holy Spirit convict a world of sin, righteousness, and judgment through the church? As we live in love, true agape love, the Holy Spirit works through that to convict sinners of their need for a Savior. Let me give you a couple of examples. 
um, individual example of a Christian whose, whose love the Holy Spirit used to reach an entire people group in South America. And, here's an, and, and then I also want to share an example of a community of believers who saved Christianity from extinction during the 4th and 5th centuries. And we're going to start with the latter. By the late 4th and 5th century, the spread of Christianity had all but stopped. The church had become Romanized. For a pagan to become a Christian, they first had to become a Roman. Because the belief was you had to be civilized to understand the gospel. And to be civilized, you had to be Roman. You had to cut your hair, shave your beard, dress like us, talk like us, learn Latin. You know, that, and so that, that was the approach the missionaries took when they started reaching out to these pagan cultures that were around them. This was the same strategy that the church tried in China from the 1800s to the early 1900s. And we got nowhere with it. We told the Chinese, you have to cut your cue, you have to come to English schools, learn to speak English, learn to read the English Bible, then you can learn how to become a Christian. That doesn't work. So then this former slave, back in the 4th century, this former slave, a guy named Patrick, took a small community of believers to live among the people who had previously enslaved him, the Irish. Patrick's philosophy was not to evangelize at all, but to live the gospel in front of the pagan Irish and allow the Holy Spirit to convict the pagans of their need for Christ based on how they saw the Christians living out the gospel in their midst. So what they did, they had these small groups of Christians who went in and built little communities next to these pagan, these, these pagan towns and villages in Ireland. And in the center of, the, the, in, in the center of the, this community, they had a cross raised up in the square, and they gathered around that every day and prayed. They, they allowed people from the pagan community to come in and live with them, be part of what they were doing. They saw how they lived and were drawn to Christ because of the way the Christians were living. By this will all men know you're my disciples, if you love each other. They were modeling that and living that out in front of a pagan culture that made betrayal and and, and uh, doing your neighbor wrong, uh, uh, just a normal way of life. You know? And, they, the, and the, the pagan Irish was like, this is better. This is no, what, what we're doing is no good. And so these whole communities were coming to Christ. And this movement that St. Patrick started spread from Ireland to Scotland into Britain and all the way into Europe. And it literally brought a revival back to Europe in the 5th century. It worked. When the pagans saw the love of God, the peace of God, the hope, joy, etc. lived out before them in the lives of the Christians that were among them, they started following Christ. That's pretty cool. The Holy Spirit was still doing his thing. We have to remember, we're not alone in this thing. While we're out living our lives in the world, the Holy Spirit is using our actions to touch people all around us in ways we don't even know. That little extra step of kindness you took to be nice to a clerk who was having a bad day at the bank and who had the slowest line and you were stuck at the end of it, and you ministered God's grace to him. Yeah. Just in a, in a gentle, hey, everything, it's okay, it's all right, you're doing good. I don't know how the Lord's are going to, he uses those little things. Like that, he does. You've had it happen in your life. Where God touched you through someone else's kindness. In the late 1950s, four missionary couples from Wycliffe Bible School moved to South America to reach the Alca Indians. They were a savage, remote, indigenous people who wanted nothing to do with the outside world. You know where I'm going if you know the story here. The Alcas slaughtered the four men when they attempted to contact them, leaving their bodies speared and on the banks of the river. One of those missionaries was Jim, was Jim Elliott, and his wife, Elizabeth, even after this had happened, continued to reach out to the Alcas, and eventually the Holy Spirit used her perseverance and love for the Alcas to convict them of their need for Christ. Elizabeth Elliott's love for the Alcas brought about a desire for change among the Alcas when nothing else about the modern world could. 
These are two examples that demonstrate how the church's nature, in, in, when it's living that nature out in Christ, how it affects the people without. We don't need schemes and gimmicks and all kinds of things to try to lure people into church. What we have and what is real is good enough for the hungry soul. Amen? So let's, let's kind of bring, I have a lot of different thoughts floating out here, and I'm going to bring them all together and, this, and, and summarize this for you this morning. We're back to where we started when we talk about the nature of the church. First, it is God's nature to be just, good, merciful, and holy. That's who he is. And as his children, that's the spirit he has imparted to us. John said, God is love. Therefore, it is in his nature to love even the most sinful. That's why we're here this morning. Because he loves sinners. Throughout the ages, God has demonstrated his nature to humanity in a variety of, we, a variety of ways. In every dispensation, we see God's divine undertaking to reach a fallen world or a people through the testimony of witnesses. These witnesses convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the prophets, all of these were witnesses in the Old Testament. Witnesses to God. But during the age of grace, the witness is God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the last witness. And during his time on earth, he convicted the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Jesus himself said he would become sin for us even. That God's righteousness could be imputed to us. He bore God's wrath and judgment on himself so that we could be saved. When he left, he sent the Holy Spirit to, con to, to continue to convict the fallen world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. This has never really been the church's job. That's been the Holy Spirit's job. And before he returned to God, however, he gathered a band of followers and prepared them for something amazing. He would send the Holy Spirit to regenerate his disciples and make them part of the great expression of himself, the church. Yeah. When the world sees a congregation of believers living together in God's love, the Holy Spirit uses that to create hunger and desire for something more in the hearts of lost people. That is because we are reflections of God's very nature. Isn't that cool? We may have to work at it. All we have to do is just stay connected to the Lord. That's all we have to do. Stay connected to the Lord. Be connected with each other in this, in this wonderful relationship. Isn't that cute? <laughs> yeah. This wonderful relationship we have you know, with him. We reflect his glory without even trying. Sometimes I think sometimes when we try... We need to stop and just step back. Say, okay, Lord, why am I posing here? What's, what's this all about? Yeah. The things we've talked about are true of the church, universal. We talked about the body of Christ as the whole. We, along with our brothers and sisters all over the world, every nation and tribe have been made a kingdom and priests to God, according to Peter. We are a kingdom. We are priests, and priests intercede on behalf of people. Every one of us. Father Freeman, priest of God. Right? Friar Buddy. Sister Paula's squared. <laughs> right? We are priests in this kingdom. We are bound together by the Holy Spirit and the love of God. We are his hands, his feet, as he continues to complete his goal of making disciples among the nations. There are people right now in Canyon City who are going to come to know Christ because of God's love expressed to our community through First Baptist. I believe that. There are people we're going to touch in 2023 that are going to come to know Jesus. There will be names in the Lamb's Book of Life. And they're going to be there because of the faithful witness of Jesus through our lives. As they watch us live out the gospel, the Holy Spirit will stir their hearts and they will cry out, I want that. 
what do you have? What makes you, what is, why are you, how do you, how do you do, deal with the stuff the way you deal with it? Because we have a great God, and I'm his ambassador. Paul said we're ambassadors of Christ. What does an ambassador do but, but bring the good news from, a, from a, a great king? A strong foundation of love has been laid in our church. I've seen it. I've heard many people's remarks about how loving our church is. People who start coming in and they said, man, I, I, just, I just, just, you feel loved and people care about you. And it's real, it's genuine, it's not fake. You know, we must guard this diligently. You hear me? We must guard that. Protect that. Do you know how unique First Baptist is? This is we, we are a, a unique group of people. Yeah. We're a bunch of Presbo Baptist Methacostalics. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's what we are. Who simply want more of Jesus. We love each other. And in 2023, we will build on this foundation to strengthen how we make disciples. Disciples who love Jesus and love each other. And I mentioned next week, Steve Van Ostrom is going to be with us from the American Baptist Regional Office, and he's going to share on the purpose of the church. Universally, we all share in this great nature of who the church is in Christ. But we have our own unique assignment here. While we're part of the universal church, First Baptist is unique. Every church, every body, every local expression of the body of Christ is unique. And we have a mission that God has just for us, and that's what we want to chase after. So next week we'll start talking about what that might look like. So if you'd stand with me, I'd like to close in prayer. We have a business meeting that we're going to be jumping into here shortly. I want to uh, invite you um, to, if you're a member, we encourage you to please stay for this business meeting. It's, I, I want to see, this meeting is an extension of our service today, okay? This is not an interruption. It's an extension. So please stay with us. If you're a guest, you're welcome to be with us you know, and, and, and participate in um, the, our business meeting. It's going to follow here shortly. Lord, you're amazing. And it seems like I say that a lot to you, but it's true. There is none like you, Jesus. And this, this incredible plan of filling us with yourself through the Holy Spirit, making us like you, God collectively shaping us into your presence on earth in this community. Father, would you open our eyes to see that and help us to, to step into it, that each one of us would take our place in the body of Christ and, and do that thing for which you have called us, Lord. Regardless of, of our station, our age, our doesn't matter. We're, we're all parts of the living body of Christ. We are living stones with Jesus Christ as our head cornerstone being built into a living temple. And God, may, the, may your life flow out of us into our community. We love you this morning. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would uh, just bless our, our business meeting as we get ready for that and that your will would be expressed in the things that we discuss and talk about as we move forward into 2023. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs>